If your product is based on a microcontroller, then this microcontroller is arguably the most important component that you need to select for your product. Changing to a new microcontroller mid-project can be an absolute nightmare, so be sure you get this choice right up front. Other components in a design can many times be changed without requiring massive system-wide changes. However, that is not the case with the microcontroller, which serves as the core of your product. When picking a microcontroller, you want to generally pick one that gives your product some room to grow. For example, if you determine that you need 16 GPIO pins, then, well, you don't want to pick a microcontroller with exactly 16 GPIO pins. If you do, then what happens if later you decide to add a new button in the future? So you'll, have, you'll need another GPIO pin. Well, if your microcontroller doesn't give you room to grow, then you may find that seemingly simple design upgrades in the future will end up requiring a massive redesign because a new microcontroller is necessary. On the other hand, you don't want to select a, a microcontroller with more performance or features than you will ever anticipate needing. For instance, if your product simply monitors temperature and humidity, then you won't really ever need an advanced 32-bit microcontroller running at hundreds of megahertz. That would be way overkill, which will add unnecessary cost and design complexities to your product. Instead, you need to find that sweet spot between having room to grow if needed, but yet not paying for performance or features that you will never really need. Selecting the right microcontroller for a project involves juggling many factors. In addition to cost, performance, power consumption, and overall size, the availability of proper software and hardware tools is a prime consideration. Support for the chosen platform is also very important, not just from the vendor, but from the community at large. It also greatly helps if the chosen microcontroller has a readily available development board. Finally, development time can be significantly reduced if the selected microcontroller has extensive, fully debugged, software libraries with well-documented application programming interfaces, or just APIs. In this video, I'm going to present microcontrollers that generally meet the above criteria. All modern microcontrollers share some basic features. On top of, of a processing unit, they have a certain amount of flash memory that is used to store the application code, some SRAM, and in most cases, some double EEPROM. They need a clock source, and this is normally provided by either an internal RC capac or RC oscillator or just resistor capacitor, or by using an external crystal for more timing critical applications. They have some digital I.O. ports and at least one timer counter. Also, other than very low-end microcontrollers, most have at least one UART for serial communications. Beyond that, microcontrollers are distinguished by the amount of memory they have, the number and type of other peripherals integrated on the chip, and how fast they are. Speed is not just dependent on the raw clock speed, it also depends on the data width of the processor and any hardware acceleration features included. Microcontrollers for embedded systems mainly fall into three categories based on the width of their data buses. We have the simplest at 8-bit, then you have 16-bit, and then 32-bit microcontrollers. There are others, but these are the most popular ones. In general, 8-bit microcontrollers are geared toward lower-end applications, and 32-bit microcontrollers are for the higher end, and 16-bit microcontrollers are kind of in the, the middle range. Most of the microcontrollers I work with tend to incorporate 32-bit microcontrollers, but 8- or 16-bit microcontrollers can be a good choice for low-end, very low-cost products. Okay, let's start by looking at 8-bit microcontrollers. If an application does not have very high demands on processing speed and is of relatively small size, then it can make sense to consider an 8-bit microcontroller. For reference, most Arduinos are based on 8-bit microcontrollers. So if you have built your early prototype using an Arduino, then you may be able to also use an 8-bit microcontroller in your final product for mass production. But don't let price alone, though, guide your decision. And in many cases, 32-bit microcontrollers can be just as cheap, if not cheaper, than 8-bit microcontrollers. For example, 
The ATmega 328P is the 8-bit microcontroller used in the Arduino Uno. It runs at 20 megahertz and includes 32 kilobytes of flash and 2 kilobytes of RAM. This chip cost a little over a dollar in volumes of around 10,000 pieces. On the other hand, you can purchase a 32-bit microcontroller running at 48 megahertz with similar memory for only about 60 cents. This is likely due to the popularity of 32-bit microcontrollers driving down their cost. That being said, there are even cheaper 8-bit microcontrollers available that cost less than 25 cents at similar volumes. 8-bit microcontrollers should typically be considered for applications that are dedicated to just doing one job with a, with a limited user interface and very little data processing. 8-bit microcontrollers come in all sizes from small 6-pin devices up to chips with 64 pins. They have flash memory sizes ranging from 512 bytes up to 256 kilobytes. SRAM sizes range from 32 bytes all the way up to 8 kilobytes or more. And double EEPROM can range from having zero double EEPROM all the way up to about 4 kilobytes or more. A minimal system can be as simple as a single chip with a bypass capacitor on the power supply rail. The three most popular lines of 8-bit microcontrollers are the 8051 series, the PIC series from Microchip, and the AVR series also from Microchip. But the AVR series was originally from a company named Atmel, which was purchased, bought by Microchip. The 8051 series was originally designed by Intel all the way back in 1981. It's now made by many other manufacturers and believe it or not, this microcontroller is still in common use today and, is, and it's embedded in numerous different appliances. While they are available as standalone devices, the 8051 is now mostly used as cores that are embedded in the silicon of dedicated application-specific chips, such as some wireless radio transceivers. Very rarely would the 8051 be the correct choice to serve as the main microcontroller for your product. PIC microcontrollers from Microchip are quite popular and have wide support available from both Microchip and various third parties. There are PIC microcontroller models available with various combinations of serial interfaces including UARTs, SPI, I2C, you can get them with analog to digital converters, USB, and a CAN bus which is used in automotive and uh, various other interfaces. Microchip provides its MP Lab X integrated development environment, or just IDE for short, which includes a C compiler for free. Also available for free as an IDE plugin is the MP Lab code configurator that generates C code for the onboard peripherals. Microchip also offers programming hardware such as the MP Lab PIC Kit 4 which is an in-circuit debugger. Higher quality commercial compilers that have better code optimization are also available. Okay, so we've looked at the 8051, we've looked at the PIC series from Microchip, now we're gonna look at the AVR series also from Microchip. And it's, an, it's another series of very popular 8-bit microcontrollers. While they are in the same space as the PIC microcontrollers that we already talked about, and have comparable performance and peripherals, they do have one big claim to fame, and that's Arduino. The original Arduinos, such as the Uno, Leonardo, and Mega, all use AVR microcontrollers. Due to the wide range of available libraries for Arduinos, the AVR series merits serious consideration for 8-bit applications, even if only for proof-of-concept prototypes. Since Arduino libraries are written in C++, they can be easily incorporated in any application written in C or C++. Software development tools include AVR Studio, or if using Arduino, the Arduino IDE and Platform I.O. are both commonly used. Hardware development tools include the Atmel ICE and the PIC Kit 4. Okay, now we're gonna look at 16-bit microcontrollers. And they are the next step up, obviously, from an 8-bit microcontroller. While they still share many of the same attributes, they're faster, they support even more peripherals, and generally offer more memory, both flash and SRAM. 
In addition to more I.O. pins, most of them also have hardware multipliers that are significantly faster and use less program memory compared to pure software implementations. It is easy to find devices that have both analog to digital converters and digital to analog converters, devices with capacitive touch sensors, segmented LCD drivers, and even Ethernet. Internally, these devices also have hardware blocks typically not found in the lower end 8-bit microcontrollers. These include encryption engines, operational or programmable gain amplifiers, and DMA or direct memory access controllers. Although 16-bit microcontrollers are available from various manufacturers, such as the popular DS-PIC 33 series, also from Microchip, I'm going to mainly focus on the MSP430 series from Texas Instruments. The MSP430 is a series of very low power 16-bit microcontrollers that are available in many flavors. They range from general purpose to very specialized models. One interesting thing about the specialized variants of these microcontrollers is that it actually branches out into two extremes. You have very dedicated, very low cost models, and then you have high-end models with analog sensor interfaces and digital signal processing. At the low end, TI also makes MSP430 based chips that solve many very specific hardware functions. For example, want a SPI to UART interface, an IO expander, or a UART to UART bridge? It's all in there and all for less than about 30 cents for this, this chip. Finally, of course, the MSP430 is supported by a number of low-cost tools and development kits. Now let's move on to the 32-bit microcontrollers, which are very powerful devices with microprocessor-like features. Some of the advanced features available on 32-bit microcontrollers include instruction pipelining, branch prediction, nested vectored interrupts, or NVI, floating point units or FPUs, memory protection, and onboard debuggers. Instruction pipelining means that the processor core prefetches subsequent instructions ahead of time, and branch prediction prefetches the next instructions on both outcomes of an if-else condition, thus speeding up code execution. NVI or nested vectored interrupts provides for interrupt priorities, where one interrupt can preempt a lower priority interrupt. Floating point units can do floating point calculations much faster than software implemented methods. Memory protection ensures that application code cannot inadvertently overwrite critical sections dedicated to the operating system, for example. Finally, onboard debugging allows peeking into registers and other areas of the system to facilitate application code debugging. All of these together allow these microcontrollers to run large, fast, and robust applications. In addition, their raw processing power means they can easily support real-time operating systems that in turn pro provide multitasking capabilities. Even though there are many 32-bit microcontrollers on the market, we're going to focus on two of the most popular. You have the ARM Cortex-M based devices, and the second one is the ESP32. The company named ARM Holdings actually only designs processor cores, which they then license to various semiconductor manufacturers that incorporate them along with some peripherals into their own silicon chips. Several prominent microchip manufacturers offer Cortex-M based microcontrollers, but we're going to focus mainly on the extremely popular STM32 line of Cortex-M microcontrollers, which is from a company called ST Microelectronics. The STM32 family is supported by a wide variety of hardware tools provided both by ST Microelectronics and third parties. An inexpensive in-circuit debugger programmer is called, is, that's available is called the ST-Link V2. It's made by ST and is available from places such as DigiKey. However, there, there are also very inexpensive clones that are available that will also work. ST Microelectronics also has a large selection of development boards under their Nucleo and Discovery families. Both of these different families of development boards contain an ST-Link debugging interface. 
All that is needed is a computer with USB running the appropriate software tool to evaluate the chosen microcontroller. Discovery boards include additional external peripherals such as MIM, sensors, and capacitive touch plates. However, Nucleo boards have headers that are compatible with Arduino shields. Another extremely popular STM32 development board is the commonly yet strangely named Blue Pill or STM32 Blue Pill. This board sports an STM32F103 Cortex M3 based chip and costs less than $2 from some sources. An appealing feature of this board is that it can be made compatible with Arduino so that the Arduino IDE or Platform I.O. can be used to write and download code for quick proof of concept designs. In fact, another common name for this board is the STM32 Duino. While this process of making it Arduino compatible is a bit involved, there are several places that sell Arduino ready boards. ST offers the STM32 Cube IDE, which is a complete development system to develop code for almost all of the STM32 based microcontrollers. As the name suggests, it's an integrated development environment or IDE that is essentially includes the STM32 Cube MX, which is a GUI hardware configuration tool and it combines that with the full compiler. Then we have the ESP32, which is a microcontroller from a Chinese manufacturer named Espressive Systems. And this has all of the typical features of a 32-bit microcontroller. However, what distinguishes the ESP32 from other microcontrollers is the inclusion of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth radios built right into the chip. This includes not just the protocol stacks, but the actual radio transceivers as well. The ESP32 is also available as a small pre-certified module with an integrated antenna. For applications that require Wi-Fi or Bluetooth connectivity, the ESP32 deserves some serious consideration. The price of the ESP32, both the discrete chip and the module are extremely affordably priced especially considering the number of features and performance packed into this chip or module.